Tonight, Boeing CEO forced out. Everybody who had their hand on the design of that, that plane should resign. Their best-selling plane still grounded after two deadly crashes. Will a change at the top help? Saudi Arabia sentences five people to death for the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, but the UN says the mastermind still walks free. We just wanted that opportunity given to us, and it wasn't. Hundreds of life-changing gifts never given. CBC News learns of wide gaps in New Brunswick's tissue donation system. And the music, the method, and the math behind church bells. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Need Cooksall filling in tonight. Boeing's CEO is out, and it is a move many believe the company should have made months ago. Dennis Mullenberg led Boeing through a disastrous year. Its 737 MAX 8 is now infamous. Two of those planes crashed, one off the coast of Indonesia, the other in Ethiopia. 346 people were killed. 18 Canadians among them. The plane was grounded around the world. Boeing temporarily halted production of that model last week. For the families that say Boeing's negligence killed their loved ones, Mullenberg's departure is a first step, but not a resolution. Jacqueline Hansen takes a closer look at the reaction, the company's struggle to gain passengers' trust and to get back in the air. This is, um... Then you'll speak to on a kindergarten. Danielle Moore's family is trying to keep their traditions, even though nothing will ever truly be the same. Christmas is very hard for us to go through because we always expect Danielle to come home on Christmas time. Danielle died in the Ethiopian Airlines crash in March. For her parents, firing Boeing CEO is not enough. The whole board of directors should go and bring in a new fresh start, uh, that would be a step in the right direction for us in terms of an apology. Three weeks after the crash that killed Danielle, CEO Dennis Mullenberg apologized in a video posted online. We at Boeing are sorry for the lives lost in the recent 737 MAX accidents. He's faced calls to resign for months. In October, Mullenberg testified before Congress where lawmakers demanded he take responsibility. Mr. Mullenberg, you did everything to drive profits over safety. I think it's time that you submitted your resignation, don't you? Congressman, I, I respectfully disagree with your premise on what drives our company. The 737 MAX 8 crashes were related to an anti-stalling software. Boeing is accused of not informing airlines about it and therefore pilots were unaware. So after more than 30 years with the company, Mullenberg is out. In a statement, Boeing says the change in leadership was necessary to restore confidence in the company. In January, Boeing chairman David Calhoun will take over as CEO, but questions about trust remain. They're not going to turn this around in, you know, two weeks or three weeks. The firing of this CEO and, replace, and his replacement is only the first step in a long chain of events. To try to get the troubled 737 MAX critical to Boeing's future cleared to fly again and build back the confidence of the industry and passengers it relies on. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Washington. Saudi authorities say justice has been done. A criminal court in Saudi Arabia sentenced five people to death today. The people behind a so-called rogue operation to murder Jamal Khashoggi. But as our Carolyn Dunn reports, others call the trial a sham. Jamal Khashoggi walked into the Saudi Arabian consulate in Turkey, never to be seen alive again. Now, after a secretive closed-door investigation, Riyadh's criminal court has sentenced 11 people in his murder. Five are sentenced to death. They are the ones directly implicated in his murder, he says. Three who covered it up will serve a total of 24 years between them in prison. The Saudi investigation concluded Khashoggi's murder was spur of the moment, not premeditated. That's contrary to the findings of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, a Turkish investigation and a United Nations probe into the killing. It is not, uh, as they try to pretend, a rogue operation or a mistake. It's a state killing. 
Today, she called the process a mockery of justice. The hitmen are guilty, sentenced to death, she posted. The masterminds not only walk free, they have barely been touched by the investigation and the trial. The publisher of the Washington Post echoed that, calling it a sham trial. Those ultimately responsible at the highest level of the Saudi government continue to escape responsibility, Fred Ryan wrote. The CIA has pointed the finger at Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and his closest advisor for ordering Khashoggi's death. Saudi prosecutors insist there was no evidence against the highest ranking government members. And this Saudi analyst told the BBC the process was transparent. First of all, there's observers from Turkey, the, the family of Jamal Khashoggi, and there's members of the uh, United, uh, Security, uh, United Nations Security Council. There's been no public explanation why. If Khashoggi's murder was an impulsive act, the killers showed up at the consulate with the tools to dismember his body. The remains of Jamal Khashoggi have never been found. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, London. International concerns intensified today as well about the treatment of a Canadian man jailed in Russia. Paul Whelan was arrested in Moscow a year ago and then charged with espionage. Since then, people in multiple countries have been fighting for his release, or at least for better care in custody. Chris Brown now on why there may be finally reason for hope. Imprisoned in Moscow's high-security Lafortova prison and accused of spying, Canadian Paul Whelan received a Christmas visit from some high-profile visitors urging Russia to free him. Paul seemed to be in reasonably good spirits today. Um, he appreciated the fact that all four embassies for the first time visited him. Whelan lived and worked in the U.S. and the Americans have been especially vocal about freeing him. But he holds citizenship in four countries. And today, for the first time, Canadian, British and Irish representatives were there too for the visit in prison. To date. Nearly one year later, the investigators have produced no evidence, zero. The case against him has gone on far too long and has been hidden from view. Russian authorities claim Whelan was caught with a USB stick full of state secrets. Whelan, a former U.S. Marine and security consultant, says he was set up. His outbursts and multiple court appearances became so disruptive when we saw him in November, authorities would only let him appear on video and with the volume turned down. So he held up a sign proclaiming his innocence instead. The case is entirely fabricated, his lawyer told us outside. No crime ever occurred. His twin brother in Canada says they've asked over and over again to talk on the phone. But no. That's correct. They don't want him uh, to be speaking to family members, to press. Uh, he's not allowed to speak to the prison monitors who come into La Fort of a prison who are Russians. Uh, and he's not even given full consular access when he meets with uh, the Canadians and the uh, Americans, British and Irish. There's always been speculation that Paul Whelan could be swapped for Russian prisoners being held in the West. And tonight on social media, Russia's foreign ministry for the first time made a link with two Russian arms dealers now serving prison sentences in the United States. They have bad conditions too, said the tweet. Let's discuss it. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Now with two Canadians still in Chinese custody, Beijing is taking fresh shots at Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Last week, Trudeau suggested the U.S. should hold off on a trade deal with China until Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor are freed. That has not gone over well with Beijing. Today, in a statement, the Chinese embassy in Ottawa said the blame for the strained diplomatic relations lies completely with the Canadian side, and attempting to gang up on China is doomed to be in vain. We have a CBC News exclusive for you tonight. We've learned more than 1,800 people who died in New Brunswick in the last few years could have been potential eye or tissue donors. But the province did not have the specialists needed to inspect the donations. Carissa Duncan speaks with grieving parents pleading for change. Michelle Astle's Christmas tree is decorated in memory of her 16-year-old son, Avery. It's her first Christmas without him, and she spent months thinking about the gift he wasn't able to give. You know, he was a kid that was all about helping others, and, you know, we just wanted um, that opportunity given to us, and it wasn't. I love this picture. It's just, it's... Uh... 
Avery's parents suspected his organs could not be used, but they hoped his tissue could be salvaged, or better yet, his eyes. You know, he had this dark hair and these be always had these beautiful blue eyes. If at least, if nothing else, if someone could have those. But the Astles say they were told there was no medical staff available to facilitate any donation, and they're not alone. Documents obtained by CBC News reveal wide gaps in New Brunswick's system for tissue and ocular donation. More than 1,800 possible donors have gone untested since April of 2017. The health authority estimates 4% of them would have been viable. That's 74 um, people um, that could, their families would be able to give that gift of life or gift of quality of life to not just one person, but could be up to 50, 60 people from that one donation. But the program struggles to recruit and retain staff. That small compliment means they're often on call in a job that is emotionally difficult. The director of the New Brunswick Organ and Tissue Program says there are fewer gaps in the system now. There's also a new policy to better answer questions from families in cases like Avery's. Astle calls it a step in the right direction, but she notes the statement fails to mention why anything changed. And it's because of Avery. So me uh, at least own that and say thank you and because of your son these changes have been made to help others. Astel says she plans to keep fighting for a better system for Avery. Carissa Duncan, CBC News, Strathadam, New Brunswick. On Friday we told you about the man shot dead in a Walmart parking lot. Well police in Red Deer, Alberta now say it was a botched attempt at a robbery this weekend the RCMP charged two people, and tonight we're learning more about the victim from his wife of 44 years. Rafi Bujakanian has her story. I'm really numb, and I'm a little bit confused today. Um, it's finally s sinking in that he's totally gone. For days now, Roxine Williams has been trying to come to grips with the death of her husband. They were near the end of a shopping run on Friday evening when they remembered he had to pick up some deodorant. She stayed in the car in this Walmart's parking lot, waiting for him to return. And he opened the car door and I heard a pop and he slammed the car door and yelled, stay there. The next several minutes were chaos. There were more popping sounds. Williams called 911. Police showed up. Williams eventually was able to safely exit the car. Started walking down the parking lane and there was my husband lying two cars away in the middle of the lane. And they were trying to do CPR on him. So I walked up there and screamed at the cop, that's my husband, that's my husband. He says, you can't come here. By the time I got to the hospital, the doctor came and said that Jim was dead. It was intensely difficult to accept. And so I sat with the body. So I was had my hand on him, on his shoulder, was rubbing his skin. And after half an hour, his body got cold. So I knew he was totally gone. She's now left with memories. He was the kind of guy that if he saw a crime happening or he could protect some other person, he would do it. So in my mind, he was protecting me. And I will always believe that he was protecting me. Jim Williams was 69. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. A bitter labor dispute at one of Canada's largest oil refineries is escalating quickly, with neither unionized workers nor management at federated cooperatives willing to back down. The picket lines at the Regina refinery are now so tense the company has to physically go over them. And today it went to court seeking an injunction to break the deadlock. Our Bonnie Allen is tracking that story for you tonight. The co-op oil refinery locked out more than 700 workers in early December, but tension has been building for years. We are here on the outside of the fence while people live inside a camp to do our jobs. It refines crude oil and supplies much of the fuel for Western Canada. Federated Cooperatives Limited earned nearly a billion dollars in profit this year. The union says the company has broken promises over pensions and is now even trying to control how they picket. 
you locked us out, you've taken our livelihood away, so we're not going to just go home and, and wait for them to call us back because that's not going to happen. So, you know, this is our right to be out here. The company was ready for a fight from the start. It set up trailers to house replacement workers and managers in order to keep the operation going. But the situation is now so heated, the company hired a helicopter to fly supplies and replacement workers over the fence. We did not anticipate that they could do in a complete blockade of a facility. So we are under siege. That's a siege. We had people in vans that had to actually urinate in bottles because they weren't allowed to leave, trapped in their vans. The company alleges that picketing workers have been unlawfully blocking access to the property, delaying fuel shipments. Truckers contracted by the company say it's put them in a tough spot. Oh, I had a driver 23 and a half hours just to get in, to get loaded, and then try to get out. We're, we're caught in the middle. We are independent. We, we, we have to worry about our own finances. You know, I got truck payments. The refinery was seeking an injunction in court today to stop all blockades. The judge reserved her final decision, but for now the union must restrict delays to just five minutes. Meanwhile, Unifor has launched a national boycott campaign to ask customers of all co-op stores in Canada to take their business elsewhere. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. In Toronto, gun violence is a reality and an ongoing concern, but it's now nearly as deadly just to walk the streets. Last night, a car leapt onto a sidewalk, hitting three college students from China and Kazakhstan. Two of them, teenagers, died in hospital. The driver faces multiple charges, including impaired driving causing death. It brings this year's pedestrian death toll to 38 in Toronto, just three fewer than those killed by gunshots. Olivia Stefanovic looks into why. These people are in a, in a big hurry. In the face of unacceptable risk for Toronto pedestrians, some politicians have been pushing back, lowering speed limits on busy streets like this. Right behind me is a place where there have been two fatalities earlier in the year. And most, they were both needless. So far, police say 38 pedestrians have been killed in 2019, a figure that's remained grimly constant over the past five years. What do you do? The police chief says responsibility falls on all road users. We can hammer people all day long. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change behavior. But Toronto police have been criticized for cutting traffic enforcement to save money. This officer admits it may be one factor in the persistent death rate. They've also taken heat for handing out reflective tape to pedestrians, which seem to take the blame off drivers. In the new year, the city will install 50 photo radar cameras in school zones and return more officers to the road. The message? You're going to be getting tickets and it's going to affect your insurance. It's going to affect your driver's license. I don't think anyone who has lived in the city has not had a close call before and I've definitely been hit a couple of times as well. David Seymour has a personal motivation for working toward pedestrian safety. Curb lanes was where we had the extra pedestrian space, the enhanced... His group created a pilot project over the summer transforming a stretch of the Danforth into a haven for pedestrians and cyclists. Overwhelmingly, 90% of people felt much safer during the pilot than they do during uh, sort of the normal use of the street, which really just demonstrates that if you create safe infrastructure, people will use it more. Toronto's past efforts have failed to save lives compared to other large cities. The hope is this time will be different. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Toronto. We are back for you with more news in just two minutes' time, including how Canadian businesses are getting caught up in Hong Kong's protest movement, plus remembering the biggest stories of the year. Our reporters talk about what the last federal election was really like. Hong Kong is gearing up for demonstrations over Christmas and New Year's Eve, with protests expected across the city once again, including in malls and other popular shopping areas, as the violence stretches into a sixth month. The protests expose deep divisions between supporters of the city's Beijing-backed government and pro-democracy activists. As Salima Shivji shows us, that divide is also apparent here in Canada. <laughs> Months of unrest and the tactics on the pro-democracy side have evolved. A color-coded boycott targeting businesses is gaining strength. Labels that show what side the owners are on 
politically. That boycott is now bleeding into Canada. A group here in Vancouver is crowdsourcing tips, dividing local stores into those same categories. Yellow for ones that support the pro-democracy protesters, the color used widely by the demonstrators. Blue, pro-China and pro-government, a signal to avoid that store, with green somewhere in between or yet to be labeled. To his surprise, Alan Yu finds himself and his auto repair shop on the yellow list, but he's pleasantly surprised. I don't mind a lot because this is my thinking, and I thought that's right for Hong Kong people. Hopefully that will uh, help the Hong Kong protester. He doesn't expect to lose business over his politics. There are no overt signs of his views outside or anywhere near any of the businesses that have been called out on the list that's been circulated for a month now. We spoke to a handful of people associated with the businesses labeled blue, pro-China or pro-government. Some were surprised to hear it. All dispute what landed them on the blue list in the first place. The man who runs the Facebook page is aware denouncing shop owners for suspected political views could be problematic. The blue business, uh, we are not encouraging any damage or whatever. We are just to let people know what if you have choice, maybe you do not go to it, spending any money in this shop. But some say the practice could lead to damage that's hard to repair. By creating these two lists, one for us and one against us, then it is going to cause, um, potentially, causing a, a great deal of division. Even so, those in charge of the list say a boycott here is a powerful tool that could help their pro-democracy cause back home. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Vancouver. And we're also watching several stories developing across Canada. Five tow trucks in the Toronto area were set on fire all within an hour overnight, all tied to an apparent turf war in the towing industry. It's just the latest in an escalating feud as different operators vie for the same areas. Dozens of trucks have been torched in recent months. Ontario's Towing Association is calling on the province to regulate the industry. Avalanche Canada has issued warnings across many parts of Alberta and in B.C. A huge storm over the weekend dumped about 80 centimetres of snow in some areas. Drivers are being advised not to take several highways and to postpone any non-essential travel until conditions improve. These earthquakes are more than 160 kilometres off the coast. So even the magnitude 6 earthquake, it wouldn't cause any damage uh, onshore on Vancouver Island or anywhere else. Four earthquakes hit just off the coast of Vancouver Island in a span of just over four hours today, each one increasing in magnitude. But officials say that's actually normal for the region and there's no cause for concern. There are no reports of injury, fortunately, or damage. Well, after the break, we look back on the Canadian political story of the year. Pace is something else. I think the only way to describe it is crazy. From the campaign buses to the campaign surprises, our reporters take you behind the scenes of Election 43. And later for you in our moment, the holiday tradition these neighbors just can't miss. We're back right after this. Twenty nineteen has been a very busy year in politics, from the impeachment of US President Donald Trump to the never ending story that is Brexit, and of course Canada's own federal election and the minority liberal government that came with it. But before that came forty days and forty nights of polarizing and at times ugly campaigning, scandals, tough questions, and regional divisions. Our parliamentary bureau reporters Salima Shivji and David Cochran we're on the campaign trail. They take a look back on this edition of our reporter's notebook. The election is the Olympics for political reporters. Especially when you're traveling with Justin Trudeau. Uh, the pace that the liberal leader, the prime minister campaigns at is insane. For me, it was my first federal election campaign. The pace is something else. I think the only way to describe it is crazy. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Halifax, Toronto, Montreal. You know, there are mornings you wake up and you're like, what time zone am I in? What city am I in? What hotel is this? Where am I? You're just completely exhausted and, and bewildered half the time. I'm David Cochran with the Liberal campaign in Edmonton, Saskatoon. 
Windsor, Ontario. On um, these policy announcements. I remember I was doing a live hit uh, for a news network. A journalist, oh my God, there's my bus leaving. I should probably go catch that okay. bus. Um, <laughs> oh no. But, um, and all I could think of in mid-sentence as I was trying to tell my story uh, live on air was that, oh dear, I'm going to be left behind in Mississauga. CBC <laughs> Saliva Shifty running to catch her campaign bus in Toronto. Look, they're even backing up. Yes. Yeah, That's nice. Cool. Tonight, a photograph jolts the federal election campaign. I was on my laptop working, and I got an email, and the picture of Trudeau in that Arabian Nights costume came up on my computer, and I was like, oh my God. And we stood up on the bus, and we turn around, and in the back of the bus, the Prime Minister's PR staff is there. There's a guy named Cameron Ahmad, we shout out, Cameron! And before we even asked the question, he stood up, raised his hands, and said, he'll address it at the airport, he'll scrum on the plane, you'll have time to file. I shouldn't have done that. I should have known better, but I didn't, and I'm really sorry. After going through that with sort of the low point of the campaign, the low point of his political career, Trudeau had to come back on board and then share the space with the people who had been screaming at him about it uh, just 20 minutes earlier. So it was, it was pretty awkward, it was pretty tense, and it really kind of derailed the whole strategy of their campaign from that point forward. It's been a core tactic of the Liberal campaign to this point to try to paint Andrew Scheer and his party as racially intolerant, and now it's the Liberals who are scrambling to contain a bombshell, as it's their leader who champions diversity and multiculturalism, who was photographed dressed in brownface, and he's done it more than once. Being on a campaign bus is is weird. I mean, obviously, the uh, parliamentary reporters in Ottawa, we know each other, we see each other on the Hill all the time, but you're in this confined space. It gets a little bit sort of like you're part of a fraternity or a sorority. It's like a family, in a way. A crazy family, because <laughs> we're all a little bit nuts. But especially in an election campaign like this one, where it was so close, so vital, so many people were paying attention, it makes you realize just how important what the leaders say is, how important you, your job is to communicate what they're saying and to tell those stories and tell them right. They did some great work. Still ahead for you here on The National. Reaching the next generation of basketball stars, we will revisit Adrian's time with Masai Ujiri's Giants of Africa. It doesn't matter where you grow up. It doesn't matter where you go to school. You can become something. Well, there is no off-season for Masai Ujiri. The president of the Toronto Raptors went from a thrilling championship win to building a team for a new season without some of its biggest stars. And in between, he dedicated his time to his passion project. Ujiri was raised in Nigeria. And this past summer, he returned to Africa and hosted a series of basketball camps. He calls it Giants of Africa, and it teaches much more than skills and sportsmanship Tonight, we revisit Adrian's exclusive look inside. When you look at the Toronto Raptors, and I look at Kawhi, and I looked at Coach Nurse, and everybody working together, okay, for one goal, to win. And that's how we should work in our countries. One goal to win. And you guys have to do that. You guys have to make the country better. Everybody understand? The Pied Piper has called them all. This is Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and they are the eager, nervous new faces of the Giants of Africa basketball camp. What does drive look like here? He looks like six foot seven. 15-year-old Freddy Dede. The smile of a kid hanging on the slimmest of chances, he's good enough to be noticed. He needs that. Freddy's an orphan, he's not in school. Joseph Peters, there in the Miami shirt, isn't in school either. It's too expensive. So to get new gear is huge. What's on your sock? This one is my picture. His prized possession until now, a pair of well-loved socks with his own face on them. All right, you're gonna get to know all of us through camp. We're gonna give you our first name, what country you're from, and we give two claps. Coach Jamma from Swaziland. Good, here we go. 
On a continent dominated by soccer, this is an oddity, and that's the point. All those coaches, some of the NBA and WNBA's finest. They're here to push a whole generation to try something different and to get good at it. Here we go now. We're going to start playing some basketball right away. When you play basketball, you got to dribble that rock and get really good. Pop, 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 pop. To let basketball be their passport to the future. I'm exhausted. They, they just kept me in immigration, that's all. No kidding, Masai Ujiri is exhausted. Hi. This camp is the creation of the Raptors president. He's been running it for years and this summer crossed the continent with it. Rwanda, Somalia, Cameroon, South Sudan. Everywhere evangelizing the lessons of sports, of his sport. If they ask me, what's your name? I say, my name is Masai Ujiri and I'm from Nigeria. Yeah? What's your name? Ifat Bo from Tanzania. Yes, what's your name? The way you're sitting already, you're not telling me your name properly. Tell me your name. They can't hear you, tell me your name. Okay, good. You need to be confident with yourselves. There is a fierceness here and a loyalty. What's your favorite team? <laughs> right here. Yes, you. What's your favorite team? Golden State? Golden State? Come. <laughs> hey, the moral of the story is, if you come to the Giants of Africa camp, your favorite team is the Toronto Raptors. There is heft at this camp. Masai has brought along Patrick Engelbrecht. He's a global scout for the Raptors. You gotta take these skills home, practice them, share them with your teammates. My man, come on up. And Jama Malalele, the head coach of the Raptors G League affiliate team. We give you a nice clap, and once you hear the rhythm going, you show it to us. Ready? both born on the continent, as was almost every other coach here. Many of us reached our dreams this past season, and I think what's really important is that the kids see that represented. When we introduce ourselves, we say, hi, I'm Coach Jam from Swaziland. I'm Coach Godwin from Nigeria. That means something, because it's a coach who's in front of them that they view as a Westerner, but really, we're from here as well. Representation is fundamental to the camp, so there's always a thought to introduce the kids to the stars in their midst. You gotta make the most of this. You gotta pay attention to everything that's being said to you. And so, seven foot three Tanzanian Hashim Tabit, the only person from East Africa to ever play in the NBA. The life he has is Joseph's biggest dream, so he gets as close as he can, which is not really that close. And there's the hope and the heartbreak of this camp. Both Freddie and Joseph know they will get three intensive days of exposure to the sport's very best. And then as fast as they came, the Giants will be gone. success of a program like this, aside from the looks on some of these faces. Well, the fact is, none of the campers from the Giants of Africa have yet made it to the NBA or the WNBA, but at least 150 of them have gone on to get basketball scholarships at colleges and universities around the world, most of them to the United States. Those scholarships mean good educations, which mean good jobs, which means doors open by basketball for a lot of kids that otherwise would have stayed totally closed. Freddie, number 61 there, still needs to work on his skills.
Joseph, though, is a standout. He's fast and confident, but that might not be enough. What did they say to you today that really sticks in your head? You play smart and you need to go into school. Yeah, me, I need to go into school. My mind is not a man I'm going to school. Not going to school isn't just Joseph's problem, it's Tanzania's. The cost can be out of reach for a lot of kids, and that's when dreams can die. So Joseph, tell me about school. When, when did you stop going to school? 24, 2014, you know, so. That was years ago, and now he has way too much time to think about what he's lost. Once, he had a high school basketball scholarship to Uganda, but after an injury, he was dumped. Now he plays anywhere he can. As then I'm pay, I'm come back. His body has healed, but that spirit has not. Why does that make you sad? Basketball for Tanzania is not easy. You play, you don't give you anything. You play, you play. I'm playing a long time. Nothing ever seems to come of it. This is a kid who feels trapped. There's both need and potential everywhere. <laughs> What's your favorite NBA team? Hey, Toronto everywhere. Yeah. Momentarily leaving the camp behind, Masai heads an hour out of Dar es Salaam to a rural school and its dusty clay court full of kids who seem so familiar. I went to a secondary school um, just like this in northern Nigeria. It doesn't matter where you grow up, it doesn't matter where you go to school, you can become something. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if my dumb ass can do it, you guys can do it even better. Yeah? Masai never made it to the NBA as a player. He found another way and needs them to see options too. And don't think he's resting on his laurels. Everybody tells me I'm the first president in all of sports from Africa. If I'm the only one, it's a failure. Yeah, but if I bring others along and one day I can say there are many more, that means it was a success. Yeah. I guarantee you that one of those kids there is going to become something big. From in, that school? Yes, from that school. Guarantee you. That's what you want. That's what I want Giants of Africa to be all about. And there are noticeable changes. On the last day, we catch a glimpse of Freddie finding his voice. He's 15 and shy, but behaving like the leader. And don't think that isn't seen by the coaches. Come time to announce a coveted spot in the all-star team, guess who gets called? Not just his dreams, Joseph gets the call too. Number 11, that's him flying down the court. And then before his new rock as pals, he plays to win. And they all notice. In the last moments of the camp, an MVP is chosen. And look who it is. Joseph is one of the smallest players here, but he shines. Yeah, champion. As thrilled as his pals and coaches are, his face says something different. He's serious and a bit crushed. The camp is minutes from ending. The coaches are about to go home, but he'll stay put. We asked what he would do next. Just work harder, he said. He needs a break, but don't count him out. Don't count any of them out. That faith is Masai's fuel. How good is this day in the office? Oh, it's the best day. It's the best day ever. 
Well, maybe not the best day ever. Yeah, yeah the best day ever was uh, in Golden State, but yeah. Yeah, the second best day. <laughs> He's not building schools or drilling wells for water. The Giants of Africa is a seed that it grows is now up to them. When we come back, we will take you inside a bell tower to understand a centuries old art form and the people behind it. It's coming up next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, part one of our first live show. A few friends of the pod join us to talk about the biggest Canadian news stories of 2019. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, few sounds embody Christmas like church bells. Loud and resonant, change ringing has been a British holiday tradition for centuries. It even has a handful of passionate practitioners here as well. Tina Lovegreen gives us an inside look at how it's done in Vancouver. The tough part is at the top. Up here, where you just got to swing yourself up. Up this narrow, confined chamber is a place not many get to see, but often get to hear from the outside. This is the belfry in the church tower. These eight bells were made over a hundred years ago for the centuries old art of change ringing. It's called change ringing because the bells change order. One bell can change one position at a time. We have eight bells here, so you're ringing rounds to start with, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Da, 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 Down below, there's a dedicated group of ringers who practice the ancient art form weekly. I was entranced and she said, oh, here, have a pull. And it was the first pull and I was hooked. I've been hooked ever since. It dates back to 17th century England, where there are still thousands of churches with change ringing bells. Here in Canada, there are seven. Three of them are here in BC. And these bells aren't to light the heaviest one, which is this one, weighs as much as a Volkswagen Beetle. But it's not a physically taxing job. So if you do this accurately, then it doesn't require very much force. If you do it accurately, there's the rub. <laughs> and it's more complicated than meets the eye. It's more math than music. Ringers have to memorize the order of each method, and there are thousands of possibilities. So you learn the method by learning the pattern itself, and then you have to learn where you start in that pattern on each individual bell. And it requires plenty of teamwork. Watch the one person pull off the rope, and then if you're the person after that person, you pull immediately afterwards. Most here aren't churchgoers. Some, like Johanna Vandenberg, were intrigued after reading a mystery novel set in a belfry. Five to three. I like learning new stuff all the time, always trying to be better at these kind of things. And also, just I just love the sound of the bells. Yeah. yeah. And these bells will sound on Christmas Eve, just before midnight mass, as is tradition. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, you heard the sounds coming up after the break. We've got some sights of Christmas, too. We'll take you to one Ontario street where they take Christmas very seriously. A 40-year tradition. We're talking thousands of lights. That's next in our moment. Christmas spirit is easy to come by at this time of year, but there are always those who take their home holiday displays to the next level. Take a look at this one street in St. Catharines, Ontario. All 28 houses on Rio Lane come together every year to continue a 40 year tradition. So we asked people who live there what it means to them. And that is tonight's moment. That brings me like, the greatest joy, knowing that our hard work of like endless weekends, getting all the decorations up, makes everyone else happy to see it. Like, like, like right now, for example, on the street, there's probably 60 people on the street. I sit out front my sometimes on my balcony and I, I ho, ho, ho to everybody. And, and the laughter from the kids, the, the laughter from adults, it's, it's just, it's an amazing feeling to see people all cheery and happy. We don't charge nothing, we just do it for the smiles from the people. Festive time of year, like I said, this has been a tradition for 40 years, and, 
and it's going to go on for another 40 as long as I'm alive. So. Okay, I was skeptical. How could they be that good? They're, they're beyond what I imagined. And they do this until the end of December, 5 p.m. to midnight, and they're collecting food now, non-perishable food items for folks. That is the National for December 23rd. I'm Neil Kirksal. Good night.